Hello everyone, welcome to Ideas and Insights. I am Badri Nathrao, your host for this program. We begin this episode by posing some questions. Do you have dreams? I mean not dreams one sees in sleep, but hopes and longings while we are awake. Have you ever dreamt of owning a giraffe or a penguin as a pet? Do you have the urge to travel to outer space? Have you entertained the idea of becoming the President of the United States? Have you longed to own a Lamborghini or an Olympic sized swimming pool? Or how about levitating? Have you yearned to float in the air totally carefree? If these dreams are too outlandish, Let's try something else. Like most of us, you have fantasized about achieving fame, wealth, and power. Or you have always wanted to travel the world. Maybe you hope to win the lottery. If you're not hedonistic, perhaps you wish to open an animal shelter or help people in distress. Or conceivably, being studious, you desire to obtain a professional degree from an Ivy League school. Or maybe do something like learn yoga or music to improve yourself. If you can relate to these fantasies, you're part of a large community of dreamers. Perhaps you're wondering where I'm going with all this. Dreams, you think, are just wishful, random reveries. We all have longings that spring from our hearts. They are personal, unique, and in consonance with our constitutional proclivities. Thus, we assume what shapes our dreams is our innate desires and personal experiences. Most importantly, we think since dreams cost nothing, we can dream anything. The only limit to our dreams, we believe, is our imagination. Contrary to our suppositions, however, dreams are infinitely more complex than the innocuous escapist musings of an indolent mind. Two sociologists, Dr. Karen Cerullo, professor of sociology at Rutgers University, and Dr. Janet Ruan, Professor Emerita of Sociology at Montclair State University, have written a book on the sociological significance of dreams. Dreams of a lifetime, how who we are, shapes how we imagine our future. A seminal work published by Princeton University Press this year, it subverts received wisdom on dreams. It argues, that dreams transcend individual hopes. They are a commentary on patterns of public culture and are influenced by various indices, such as one's social location and cultural capital. They say dreams are refracted through the prism of one's class, race, gender, life course, and peculiar circumstances. Professors Surulo and Ruan maintain that dreams are fictional expectations, unlike aspirations backed by well-considered plans or roadmaps. They point out that though not always rational or leading to concrete outcomes, dreams provide us a window. They give us a glimpse into a person's essence, identity, and sense of self. They allow us to see what a person truly values. An intellectual tour de force, Dreams of a Lifetime, is a rigorous work of scholarship that delves into the dreams of a representative sample of 272 people, ranging from children in grade three to senior citizens. In focus groups and individual interviews, Professor Cerullo and Ruan asked the respondents one common question. If you knew you could not fail, what would you do? Or 
where would you go or what would you want to have or who would you want to be? In the finest tradition of sociological scholarship, their work throws up several startling revelations about dreams of which five prominent findings stand out. First, the authors were struck that 86% of respondents repeatedly claimed that dreaming was essential. Their dream themes overlapped considerably, mirrored socio-cultural patterns, and centered around career, adventure, fame, wealth, power, family, philanthropy, and self-improvement. Second, though most dreamers had no concrete plans to actualize their longings, their dreams tell us something about the cultural lessons saturating different social spaces and how they structure one's imagination. Third, most respondents were inspired by the positive lessons of American public culture, such as hard work and perseverance. Fourth, the dreams illustrate that one's social location and its culture influence their content. The potential and possibilities one sees for the future are powerfully embedded in the social point by which one views future horizons. Fifth, cautioning against blind optimism, professors Cerullo and Ruan call for balance in making dreams productive and beneficial. They posit that dreams demand reflection. To be effective, dreams also require concrete action. Further, if life without robust dreams is barren, blocking the path to realizing dreams is frustrating. It can force one to abandon their dreams. Disadvantaged dreamers, the authors say, can benefit from advisory support for fulfilling their dreams. A singular achievement of professors Rulo and Ruan is their accent on the inequality of the dreaming landscape. They were that a level playing field and more equitably distributed opportunities are necessary for dreams to come true. An apposite blend of methodological rigor, rapier sharp analysis, and nuanced sociological sensibilities, dreams of a lifetime is a stellar addition to social science scholarship. Professor Karen Cerullo and Professor Janet Ruan join me to discuss their work. Welcome to Ideas and Insights, Professor Cerullo and Professor Ruan. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you for having us, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. You are Absolutely. Very, you are it was a welcome. wonderful, wonderful uh, review of the essentials of the book, really. Thank you. Let's begin with the obvious question. Dr. Surolo, what drew you to the study of dreams, and why do you think this is important? What drew me to the study was something very casual. I was doing some errands around the Christmas holiday, uh -huh. and I heard someone on the radio pose a question to listeners. If you knew you couldn't fail, what would you do? I found myself mesmerized by their answers, as well as the answers of people I spoke to after hearing the show, my co-author, relatives, and so forth. And it got me to thinking that dreaming was something that really was socially bound. And I wanted to find out more about it, as did uh, Janet. So Dr. Ruan, how did you get drawn into this? It was uh, Karen telling me about her, her drive home experience. Uh -huh. And, and uh, I immediately started offering her my list <laughs> of dream possibilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, got, we, we were mesmerized. And it was, as Karen said, right before the holidays. And so we took that question to holiday gatherings and holiday tables. Interesting. And, and, Dr. Yes, Cerullo, you say dreams are more than personal fantasies. They provide an insight into 
a person's inner self. What do you mean by this and why is it important? Well, I think that when we ask a question that takes failure off the table, what we're able to do is to have people consider what they really want if there's no boundaries and no obstacles in front of them. And that tells us something about who they are, who they would like to be, where they would like to land in life. And that I think is important because it gives us something different from, um, you know, aspirations. I'd like to get a college education or things that you're already involved in. This is sort of saying something about your inner self and really giving us some insight into people's identities and how those identities change depending on where you stand in the society. I'd like to uh, invoke that uh, Thoreau quote that dreams are the touchstone of our character. I think they reveal our core selves. Dreams are what make the strings of our heart zing. <laughs> All right, and that point is well taken. However, as you have demonstrated through your research, these dreams are imaginings that do not result in concrete outcomes. Some might say that it's all right to get to know who these dreamers are and what their values are and so on, but considering that they have no intention of taking concrete steps to realize their dreams, that they are lackadaisical, why should we even bother? What do you have to say? Professor uh, Cerullo? Yeah, I think that some people do take concrete steps to achieve these uh, after they've been thinking and thinking about them, or they take a step to get them to a similar place. For other people, they are, can be comforting, they can be exciting, uh, they can be ways of removing someone from where they're, where they're living at the moment. Um, and so I think that that uh, tells us again something about who people are disconnected from what they're doing at the day to day. And I think understanding the essence of people and how that essence shifts is sociologically speaking, something very important to learn about how we view ourselves and the world. Psychologists and psychoanalysts see dreams as something that, uh, reveal a person's repressed desires. But sociologists see patterns in dreams. What are these patterns and why do you think they're important? Well, one of the reasons we found that particular uh, result of patterns su surprising or interesting is I think the very common belief that in America, everybody shares that one dream in the American dream and that that tells it all. It is such a common view of how we dream. And what we discovered is we could hear the dreams of over 270 respondents, and we were able to break them down into the common themes of adventure, career, fame, wealth or power, family, philanthropy, and self-improvement. So. There was variety, but limited variety. There was not uniformity in the sense of everybody here is essentially striving for that American dream, the quintessential dream associated with the US. Professor Cerullo, the American dream has a great fascination for people in this country and that's borne out by your research. I have two questions. Your study is predominantly focused on people in America. One, why is the American dream so very central to our national narrative? And secondly, I just wondered if we did this study, say in Somalia or Yemen or some other troubled region of the world, what would their dreams be like? Well, let me answer your first question. I think the reason why the American dream is so solidified is that, you know, we looked at 
all sorts of cultural outlets, traditions, films, books, um, uh, narratives, sayings, uh, you know, wisdoms. And we just found that that message of the American dream just saturates the society. And if you're growing up in that society, you can't help but internalize that vision, that that is how life should be lived. Uh, we are uh, hoping to be able to replicate the study in other countries because we want to find out what does it mean in other industrialized countries that may have a different kind of cultural philosophy, say uh, South Korea or China or India. What does it mean in countries that are poorer in Somalia, uh, in Mexico? Are the dreams going to be the same or are we going to see vast differences? So that's a question that's yet to be answered. We hope to be able to explore that. Professor Ruan, going into this study, what was your hypothesis and what did you expect to find out? Well, I must say that we were going in um, with few preconceived notions. Mm -hmm. We wanted to be as open as possible to, to learning what we did not know. Um, but we also thought that people's life experiences, their age, uh, their gender, uh, did they experience life traumas, uh, serious illnesses, uh, natural disasters. We intentionally went out and sampled across that wide array of social conditions because we suspected there might be a connection between those kinds of experiences and dreams. But we really were there to learn because frankly, the topic of dreaming as opposed to the American dream is not well researched. And so we were really out there in the sense of exploring what we thought was a new a new uh, area. I wonder if I could just uh, tag on to that. You know, I think that when you look at literature on dreaming, you see two extremes, the American dream on the one hand, or the idea that every person has a dream that's going to be different from everyone else. And we thought that probably both ends of those continuum were, were not going to be what we found. And we believed as sociologists, that things like your gender, your social class, your race, were going to influence the kinds of things that people dreamed about. Interesting. Let's now move to the dream themes. You have created a typology of 10 dream themes. Can you tell us more about these themes and the rationale for coming up with these 10 uh, templates? Well, I think, um, you know, we didn't go in with a rationale. Mm -hmm. we've, we've actually found six major themes. There were just a, a, you know, a sprinkling of people, five, six people who mentioned something other than this. But as Jan mentioned before, they were adventure, career, fame, wealth, and power, philanthropy, family, and self-improvement. And we didn't uh, go in with those categories predetermined. That's really what arose from what people told us. Professor Ruan, one thing that you emphasize in your uh, book and that stands out prominently is that no matter what, the overwhelming majority of your respondents repeatedly said that dreaming is desirable, it's good, and one must have dreams. Now, Absolutely. what do you make of that? Why is it so very popular, even for people at the lower uh, echelons of the social hierarchy uh, and those that have uh, internalized the negative lessons of American public culture. They, even they want to dream. Why? Absolutely. That dreaming is essential, is, is clearly a major takeaway from our respondents. They, they questioned how we would lead a meaningful life if we didn't dream. And they just absolutely would not entertain the possibility 
even those individuals who were facing great life challenges, those who had lost their homes in hurricanes, those who had received cancer diagnoses, they were two groups that were most uh, uh, embracing the idea that dreaming is the lifeblood of living, that it is essential. And so it really, in an, another uh, short piece we wrote, we said, uh, we have exploded the myth that uh, bad things will destroy people's dreams. We say au contraire, people who have experienced awful things often double down on their commitment to dreaming. Professor Cerullo, that point is well taken. However, if dreaming is so essential, and if people are committed to dreaming, why wouldn't they bother to implement their dreams, barring a handful that you mentioned earlier? There seems to be a disconnect there. How do you explain that? You know, I think that one of the things that makes people's dreams come true is that people are mentored in some way mm -hmm. to take a dream that feels unachievable or perhaps unrealistic and have a mentor show them how they might achieve that. And one of the things that we talk about in the book is how important it is to not only have people dream and ask them and talk with them about their dreams, but then to get down to the nitty gritty of how they might achieve that or how they might achieve something similar that would improve their lives or make them happy or change their course or what have you. Just as we, for example, uh, take people who don't have the uh, sufficient mathematical skills and give them remedial instruction. We think here it would be very helpful to give people remedial instruction on how to translate your dream to an actual plan that you can execute. I, I'd love to just jump in here a moment. Mm -hmm. We've been watching, for instance, uh, the Serena Williams last uh, set of tournaments. Uh, uh -huh. And it was so clear is that individuals who achieve their dream, and she did acknowledge that this was a lifetime dream of hers to be a tennis champion. They're quick to add that they had the support and needed the support to do it. Uh, Derek Jeter in, in a recently uh, run uh, uh, what bi biographical review of his career, He's constantly saying that he dreamed as a young child of being this great Yankee star, but he would never have gotten there without support. And so I think that's what we again hope is a major takeaway from this book. We have a cultural lesson that says optimism makes anything possible. We want to tweak that and say that it's support that's needed to make anything any dream possible. We will come to uh, the two points that you mentioned, uh, Professor Ruan, about optimism and blind optimism. And we'll also talk about uh, the prescriptions that you have for making uh, dreams come true. But for now, let me ask you a follow-up question, Professor Ruan. Look, a lot of your respondents said that they uh, wanted their dreams to live on, whether or not they were around. They wanted to pass on their dreams to the next generation. Again, this begs the question, if this is how important dreams are to you, why didn't you bother to do anything in your lifetime to actualize them? What do you have to say to that? Well, again, based on what we heard from our respondents, uh -huh. I wouldn't say that it's a fair characterization to say they didn't bother trying to actualize their dreams. I think what, what some of them did admit is that perhaps they, they started too late, that they realized how important and long standing these dreams were after years of living. And I think that's in part why they're so willing to say yeah, this is a dream important enough that if I could, I'd 
I'd love to pass it on. Again, I think acknowledging that it may take more than what I gave it, but I I wouldn't uh, necessarily characterize what we heard from our respondents as folks who were pie in the sky and nothing else. I mean, so many of these dreams were about not highfalutin things like fame or, or power, but everyday things like I want to be able to take my family on a, uh, a, a vacation, an extended family on a vacation and be able to afford to do that. Well, you know, they're making smaller steps towards that, but their big dream is almost, if you wanted to see a grander version is like establishing a compound where that family might go every year and gather in a more of a reunion fashion. Well, so, um, I'm Professor sorry. Cerullo, let me take issues with this. Uh, while discussing your uh, interviews with the unemployed, you make two points. Number one, you say that they have understandably internalized the negative lessons of our culture. They think the deck is stacked against them, etc. And to me, what's important is, though they were unemployed, self-improvement did not interest them at all. And you, you make note of that. Now, that goes against what Professor Ruan said just now. What do you have to say to that? Well, I don't know that it goes against it. I think what we see in the book is that there's certain groups uh -huh. and the unemployed are one, uh, those who are in the lower social economic classes and racially speaking, our Latinx respondents mm -hmm. were three groups that were had less lofty dreams, uh, did not feel quite as certain that their dreams would ever come true. And while they thought dreaming was important, percentage-wise, that was less true for them than some of the other groups. So I think that's the sociology of this, that you know where your feet are planted in a society may make you less likely to embrace all of the optimistic sorts of beliefs we have about if you work hard, you can get anything you want, and you know dreaming, uh, all your dreams will come true. I think what we're acknowledging is that there's certain locations in societies where you are faced with circumstances that don't allow you to overcome um, getting to that place of optimism. And again, if I just may jump in, Please they, do. Um, the unemployed, I, I call, I say that they were the most blocked of all the groups we uh, talked to uh, in dreaming. And you're absolutely right. They were not willing to talk about self-improvement, but you must also consider that they were the group that felt least control, in least control of their dreams. And so my sociological take on that is they felt the victim of circumstances in terms of what was happening in the larger society or the economy. And they frankly were bewildered by the fact that they were not getting jobs. And so I'm not sure it's a disconnect again. I think that they w were saying we did everything right and we still got terminated. I want to contrast that with the individuals who suffered homelessness because of a natural disaster or mm -hmm. hurricane. Mm -hmm. Those folks often talked about improvement being needed, but they talked about it as if that natural disaster was somehow a punishment for them, that they hadn't done enough to ready themselves perhaps for, or taking the warnings of the impending disaster seriously. So uh, again, I think it's <laughs> need to take the circumstances of what may have led to their current status of being homeless or being unemployed into consideration. All right, let's move on. Professor Sorolo, you folks say that uh, there are limits to what one can dream, and these limits are imposed by one's culture. But the commonsensical question would be, well, I can dream what I want. It's an intensely personal thing. How can 
my culture limit my dreams? In other words, how and in what ways does a culture pattern one's dreams? Well, I think it has to do with what you're seeing and hearing around you and what you internalize as possible. Now, I think back to a set of uh, focus groups that uh, we did with third graders. And I was struck by the fact that while some of the male white children mm -hmm. were coming up with things like being star football players or owning mansions, uh, one of the Latinx uh, lower class girls told me her dream was to package groceries at the local uh, supermarket. And so you know, my feeling was that even before her life has really begun, she's seeing and it's being sort of inculcated in her that the possibilities were limited by virtue of where she stood in the society. And that's how I think these social aspects are influencing how we dream. It's not the case necessarily that we can dream anything we want. Technically, yes, I can. I think, I guess, yes, we can. But I think we're being limited by where we're living and what we're seeing as potential possibilities. Professor Ruan, while talking about culture, you have referenced the work of sociologist Anne Swidler, and you discuss her idea of public culture. Now, public culture is not homogenous. It uh, offers positive lessons, and you list out four of them. And it also gives negative lessons. I would like you to please tell us more about what this idea of public culture is and what's the exact mechanism by which people retrieve some elements of public culture at one point and some others at another point. Thus, for example, Latinx respondents uh, in your study had uh, negative lessons predominant in their narratives. They thought that the system was really ranged against them and they were not too happy. So how does public culture work and what are the strategies we use to access it? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to say that public culture works in a almost a subconscious way mm -hmm. in the sense that as we are living our lives being socialized we are we are getting those messages just from our day-to-day -day, everyday exchanges and interactions that there's no stopping uh, the transmission of public culture and the lessons such as opportunity is boundless you, you dream big the bigger, the better, um, and never, ever giving up on your dreams. I mean, think about the the, the childhood um, books that children are being read, and the little engine that could is teaching uh, a positive cultural lesson. I don't think there's any escaping cultural lessons, and I think those cultural lessons are absolutely tied to the particular context you're, you're in. So we heard, yes, lots of folks who were in disadvantaged statuses talk about dreams, state their dreams, but then come back and remind us that uh, the higher you are, the, fall you, the uh, farther you can fall, uh -huh. <laughs> or that the, the deck is stacked so you cannot be, you cannot be overly committed or blind to your um, dreams. I should defer here to Karen because she is the Swidler, uh, <laughs> Swidler expert. All right. Well, I, I just wanted to jump in here though. Your question reminded me of something I heard Joe Biden say in a speech for, uh, he gave for the eulogy of his father. Uh -huh. He was from a working class family and he described his father as a dreamer who was burdened by reality. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what we saw among respondents who were from the lower class, economically speaking, the Latinx respondents, the unemployed respondents. 
they were looking at all the array of lessons that exist out there in public culture and they were having to select things that resonated with their day-to-day -day life. And so, yes, one of those lessons is opportunities are boundless, but if you're looking around in your neighborhood and seeing that people are working two and three jobs and there's not any opportunity for them, you have to sort of reject that lesson in favor of something like the deck is stacked. Um, so that's what I think is happening, that people are looking at the array of public culture, and even though it's dominated by positive lessons on dreaming, their experiences are drawing them to the more negative lessons. I, again, I'd like to add that I'm a sociologist burdened by uh, a dream, <laughs> burdened by reality. I, too, am from Scranton, PA. I know Joe Biden's uh, background in terms of where he came from. And uh, if you were to ask me what was the dream I identified when Karen first asked me this question, I said, oh, give me that oceanfront property in Cape May. <laughs> and, and yeah, I can tell you in all of my trips to Cape May, it's been to a small motel <laughs> that I could afford. <laughs> and I go walking up and down the beach <laughs> and say, oh, if only one day, but it's never going to happen. So I think we have that that uh, tempering of our our lessons with our own reality that we are burdened with. Yes. Well, Professor Ruan, I must say you chose the wrong profession. So. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we are sociologists, and so our dreams have to be realistic, shall we say? <laughs> All right. Let's move on. We now go to uh, your discussion of French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu's uh, work. He says that one's social location and its culture has a huge impact on the individual and, and their life chances, their dreams, and so on. Would you be able to tell us more about this, Professor Cerullo? Yes, I think, you know, Bourdieu is famous for that term habitus. Exactly. But what he's really talking about is the view of the world that we internalize based on where we're located. Mm -hmm. And Bourdieu, of course, was writing predominantly about class. But what others since uh, Bourdieu have argued and what we argue in the book is that it's also true for race. It's also true for gender. You know, I, I'm thinking, you know, as one example, when we looked at the gender comparisons of dreaming, it's 2022 and we still saw that there were distinct gender differences in the way men dreamed and women dreamed. You know, men were in there in the stereotypical way, thinking about power, thinking about adventure, and women were talking about things like family mm -hmm. and self-improvement, mostly self-improvement, meaning the way they looked or their weight. Um, so, you know, we're seeing that those aspects of our social profile, if you will, um, are really about that worldview that we've internalized based on where we've grown up in the society and what our social place is. Professor uh, Ruan, let's now talk about uh, phenomenologist uh, Maurice Marlowe Ponty. You talk about her idea of point horizon. She's also making a similar point about uh, one's uh, sp space, the, uh, the place where one, one is, and one's point horizon has a disproportionately large impact on how one sees the world. Can you elaborate on this, please? Well, I think, uh, again, to keep it as simple for the audience or straightforward, it's, we're talking about how your location affects mm -hmm. your perception. And so it, it does matter where you are located for what you see uh, as, for instance, that uh, obtainable dream. I, I have to tell you my other dream, uh -huh. <laughs> in addition to owning that, that oceanfront property, was to be the next Oprah. <laughs> I thought, I give, give me Oprah's talk show in life. And I don't think that it was any small accident that I wound up instead of uh, a celebrity with my own show for X number of years, 
I wound up in a college classroom <laughs> where I had an audience uh, that had to give me their attention, <laughs> if nothing else, for uh, a finite amount of time, three days a week. I, I do think that we are talking about seeing the world in different ways. But again, I must defer to my, my uh, colleague here because she is the eminent cultural sociologist in my mind. <laughs> well, I, I think Jan explained it beautifully, but you know, uh, I think it's a very uh, a simple metaphor. You know, imagine you're standing on the beach and depending on where you move or how the sunlight is uh, hitting at a particular time of day, mm -hmm. the horizon looks different to you. And that metaphor is carrying over into the social world. Depending on where your feet are, are you in a privileged place? Are you in an, uh, a, a place of poverty? Are you female? Are you male? As you look out to the horizon, where you're located, uh, metaphorically speaking, is going to change the way that horizon looks to you. I think really it's that very simple concept that Merleau-Ponty was trying to get across with that, that visual image. Interesting. Before I move on to the next question, since you are kindred souls, let me <laughs> say something that perhaps you might commiserate with. I firmly believe in a classless society, but I have to be in class three days a week, like <laughs> Professor Ruan, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's not something I bargained for, but then such is life. Anyways, <laughs> now one thing that struck me a great deal uh, in your book was your very uh, astute analysis of the data, and you approach it from the perspective of race, gender, and, uh, and class. Could you please, Professor Sorolo, tell us briefly what your findings were when you looked at the data from the lens of race, class, and gender? Yes, I, you know, I think what we found, for example, is that people who were in the upper or middle classes tended to have more uh, diverse dreams, mm -hmm. tended to be more um, anxious to dream, and felt that they could dream, uh, have one dream, accomplish it, go on to have another, go on to have another, whereas folks in the lower classes might have held a dream for their entire life because circumstances did not allow them to obtain it. And so uh, they you know, held on to it and kept trying. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we found that people who were racially privileged, in particular whites, um, were more apt, again, to have grandiose dreams, uh, whereas those who were in um, in what we might call subordinate racial positions mm -hmm. tended uh, not to have uh, dreams that were quite as elaborate. Um, as I said before, we found that men and women had dreams that sort of fit the male and female stereotype. Um, so there were these kinds of patterns um, that we found differed across um, those uh, kinds of variables. But we also found that some things were the same across the board. For example, everybody tended to be the star of their own dream and um, did not really include other people in their dreams. So the scope was very individualistic. We also found that sometimes people expressed the same dream theme, mm -hmm. but interpreted it in a very different way. So some of our Asian um, uh, respondents, for example, talked about career, but for them, what career meant was something quite grandiose. They wanted to be a, a notable lawyer or, or own a corporation or be a world famous doctor, whereas the uh, Black or Latinx uh, uh, respondents that we had were um, thinking of career as you know, owning a flower shop, owning mm -hmm. a small delicatessen. So career had very different meanings, even though people were talking about career uh, across the board. Likewise right, I, for self-improvement, correct? Yes. Uh, and again, you know, uh, we were very struck by the fact that self-improvement for women came up with uh, always meaning um, improving their physical appearance. Um, <laughs> You know, which is uh, for for us was a very sad finding in 2022. Uh, again, 
um, we saw those kinds of things uh, with regard to race, that um, in many ways, people who were unemployed or people who were poor or people from the Latinx group um, felt that they might be doing something wrong and that they had to work on themselves. Whereas for whites or Asians, self-improvement meant expanding what they already had achieved, that it was building more privilege in essence, uh, more wealth. So yeah, those differences, again, even though self-improvement was the category, there was a lot of um, uh, you know, variation within that category. And let me just add that that was very clear when we talked to uh, folks of the lower class versus the upper class, self-improvement got translated into working on yourself for the lower class. Mm -hmm. Self-improvement for the upper class was improving your social conditions environment. Uh, we thought a very noteworthy, noteworthy distinction. Indeed. Right. Getting, getting the corner office, uh, becoming chief of staff, <laughs> uh, that kind of thing. And, and the same thing with career. While career turns out to be an incredibly popular dream, n not surprisingly, in, the, in America, uh, career for the lower class individual meant getting a job and keeping it. Career for the upper class individual meant those continuous steps to ever and ever and better and better upward advancement. Interesting. Let's now move on, Professor Ruan, to uh, the impact of life course and ruptures in one's life on dreaming. You looked at the data uh, from these two perspectives as well. What can you tell us, Professor Ruan, about your findings? Well, we, as we mentioned before, we started with a pretty young age group. Uh -huh. we, we consulted educators in our elementary schools, and they, they recommended that we start talking with third and fourth graders. We learned, for instance, that it's third graders who were more more likely than any other age group to have fantastical dreams, some of which you mentioned at the beginning of your introduction, ha having those pet giraffes, uh, having an unlimited supply of pickles, um, becoming invisible, going underwater and holding your breath forever. <laughs> the curious thing is that by the time those third graders got to fourth grade, realism had come into the dreaming process. And, and that was for us one of those surprise distinctions that as early as fourth grade, that idea of career being an important wish for tomorrow, uh, imagining for yourself, that was already taking firm root. Uh, we know, for instance, uh, with that tragedy in um, Texas earlier, in the summer, mm -hmm. where the fourth grade class was was uh, attacked by that gunman. The parents were coming forth and, and reaffirming what we were finding, that yet by the fourth grade, those kids had dreams of becoming marine biologists, one, one victim mother had said, of becoming a famous um, lawyer. And so that, that was an eye opener for us. Uh, Fantastical dreaming did not totally disappear. We had some senior citizens who, mm -hmm. for instance, wanted to elevate and they uh, wanted to um, Levitate, be able to overcome uh, the, the boundaries of gravity. Uh -huh. um, but for the most part, as we age, we become more realistic dreamers. Um, it was high school students and college students who were most likely to dream of fame, power, and wealth. Mm -hmm. And that then diminished the older you got. Uh, interestingly enough, though, maybe not, uh, though, I should leave that out. The high school and college kids had nothing to do with family as part of the <laughs> Yet, when You we aren't get surprised, to, are you? <laughs> no. When we get to people in their 30s and 40s, that becomes... The, for the first time, a double-digit uh, dominant dream that family now is the is the uh, most important thing. Age a little more, 
and family drops back in importance, those respondents saying to us, hey, I've done that. My parenting is over. And so now I'm going to, to move on to uh, more uh, self-improvement or philanthropy now becomes a major topic for those who are aging. Uh, for the seniors, uh, we, we say that age had a very liberating effect on them. Mm -hmm. uh, they, were, they were the most expansive dreamers, and they were also, at, in terms of age groups, the most insistent that you should never give up on your dreams. Even with them facing the shortest future lifespans, they were the ones saying, don't ever give up on your dreams. Um, when it comes to social disruptions, we had those three major uh, groups we looked at, people who we say were displaced by natural disasters, people who had faced, were facing health challenges, and uh, then the chronically unemployed. And uh, the, the surprising but actually very gratifying finding, dominant finding there for us, was how optimistic the displaced and the health challenged remain. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, the health challenged, those who were facing their own mortality uh, and not sure of what indeed the future would hold for them, they were the most confident of all of our groups in uh, their ability to achieve their dreams. And 100% of that health challenged group felt that dreaming per se was important that we had to do it and i think it's also encouraging that even when you've lost everything your home uh, one woman who had spent a lifetime building toward her dream and achieving her dream of her owning her own home saw it taken away in a hurricane and she said uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna start again it's gonna be hard but i'm gonna try to get that home built again um, we are almost they, out of time. Uh, ah, let me ask you one last question. Forgive me for interrupting. I'm sorry. Uh, I was carrying on too long. That's <laughs> all right. Uh, Professor Cerullo, uh, one important uh, element of your book is the connection you make between dreaming and inequality. Can you tell us how the two are related and what the consequences are? Well, I think what we're saying here and what we're finding is that people who lack opportunity, uh, that the effects of that start not just with what you accomplish and what you plan, but it, it starts in the mind, in what you think is possible, what you dream about. And, you know, I come back to that idea of how important it is to start early not only discovering what people's dreams are, but then helping them understand how they can be realized. Because without that ability to help people plan, um, dreams are nothing more than figments of the imagination that may ultimately lead to frustration. So those who are the most disadvantaged need help in how, how, how they can go about achieving a dream and being encouraged then to keep dreaming. I'll give Professor Ruan the last word. We have just about a minute. Professor Ruan, this is a question about the, the suggestions you have for dreamers. And of course, as we have discussed, you folks want disadvantaged dreamers to be helped. Now, I'm sure you realize that's a huge segment of the population. There are a lot of people who could do with help. Now, in terms of concrete strategies for implementing your suggestions, do you have any thoughts? Very briefly. Yes. Well, Karen mentioned earlier that we have uh, suggested that as just as there are these remedial classes to help folks who are not adequately prepared, underprepared as they enter college for math, or science or, or reading skills. We think we should start thinking about remedial work for those individuals who don't understand that there is a series of steps or a process. You need it to be engaged in if you wanna translate a dream into something uh, re more achievable, something that indeed you can accomplish. 
And I, I would also add that we talked earlier that dreaming in America is, is so often a solo mm -hmm. envisioning, that you're there by yourself. And I think that's part of the problem that individuals early on fail to recognize that dreamers who make it aren't solo, that they need the social support system. And so I would like to see us address that uh, and help people understand they've got to build a social network if they really hope to achieve their dreams. And aside from that, of course, you do mention the importance of creating a level playing field and more equitably distributed opportunities. Professor Karen Cerullo, Professor Janet Ruane, it was a great pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for sharing your insights. We wish you the best. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thank you. That's it for this episode of Ideas and Insights. Thanks for joining us today. In the coming weeks, we will discuss the return of the state and why it is essential for our health, wealth, and happiness, written by Professor Graham Gerard. In this book, published by Yale University Press this year, Professor Gerard maps the trajectory of the modern state since its inception in the 16th century and outlines its vicissitudes in different epochs. He makes a powerful case for the state as our only realistic hope of countering the rising power of multinational corporations, organized crime, and international organizations that always put their interests first. Today, the state is essential to the health and welfare of everyone except the rich and powerful. Yet, it is being rolled back and whittled away leaving the well-being of most of us at the mercy of unaccountable private powers that are increasingly free from external control. Professor Gerard argues for the return of a public interest state in which the economy serves the public purpose rather than the other way around. Watch out for an exciting discussion in the coming weeks. Until then, stay safe and goodbye.